Strike presents your hit parade, starring Frank Sinatra. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? And now, smile a while with Lorenzo Jones and his wife, Belle. Here's the Manhattan merry-go-round that brings you the bright side of life, that whirls you in music to all the big night spots of New York town, to hear the top songs of the week sung so clearly you can understand every word and sing them yourself. This is the Golden Age of Radio. I'm Dick Bertell, and tonight we'll take you on another audio excursion back to radio's formative years. You'll hear the programs that made the era golden and meet people who made those broadcasts a reality. The Golden Age of Radio, brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, serving Central Connecticut since 1889, and by WTIC. You'll meet announcer-actor Jackson Beck after these words from the Burrett. When looking for that new car, here's a suggestion. Go to Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. No, the Big B doesn't sell new or used cars, but it does help people to buy them. Chances are that you didn't know that Burrett Mutual Savings Bank will make you a car loan at low, low rates. Before buying that new car, call any of our convenient offices for information. But wait, that's not all. You'll need another car when this one wears out, and the Big B has a plan for that, too. When you finish with your new car loan... Keep on making the payments into a Burrett Mutual Savings Account, where you will earn big, big dividends with no effort at all. Rates range from 5 to 6%, depending on the plan you choose. But whatever the plan, the next car you buy will be paid for by your Burrett Mutual Passbook. So don't wait. Drop in at any office of the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank for your new car loan. Or to make that monthly payment on your old car loan. Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. New Britain, West Hartford, Rocky Hill, and Glastonbury. Member FDIC. And now in a program recorded at the second annual convention of the Society of American Vintage Radio Enthusiasts, your host, Dick Bertell. Good evening, and with me once again is Ed Corcoran, the man with how many hours of old-time memories on tape, Ed? Uh, 2,633, Nick. <laughs> and I think you're adding to them tonight, because our show is originating on tape from the Grand Ballroom here at the uh, Howard Johnson Motel in New Britain, where the second annual Society of American Vintage Radio Enthusiasts is holding a rather enthusiastic meeting. And our special guest is a voice that is well known to all of you, I'm very sure, Jackson Beck. Well, Jack, it's so good to have you at this microphone. Well, it's really, show. it's really uh, a very pleasant experience to be here. It really is. I know you hear this a lot, but particularly this, this organization, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure and a privilege, really, to uh, be associated with it and to attend their uh, get-together. What do you think of, of people who just collect because they, they like to reminisce, they like to recreate those wonderful moments that we all knew back in the 30s? I think they're marvelous people. I really do. Uh, you know, someone once said that imitation was the sincerest form of flattery. But I tell you that that can be topped when you are alive and kicking and find yourself the subject of a collector. Now, really, what greater compliment, what, what bigger thrill can there be? To, you know, I feel like a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Or an old bottle. (laughs) That's very well put. This show, as a matter of fact, is collected by uh, many people throughout the country. They they, uh, either tape it off the air or someone gets a copy to them. uh, So so you'll be in this collection as well. Let's begin with uh, the Jackson Beck story, which had its start right in New York. Most people come out of the Midwest. Why did you happen to start in New York? I was born there. (laughs) I had no choice. (laughs) And you, uh, you answered an ad. You, you know, too I... can be a radio announcer. Well, it, that happens to be the truth. Uh, I guess I'm, you know, one of a very few that uh, an ad like that really uh, did anything for. I was a kid. And I wanted to be an actor. My father, who had retired from business and was pretty well off until the Depression hit, and then he went back into the theater. And uh, he didn't want me to have any part of it because it's a rough life. It really is. You know that. 
And uh, I wanted uh, to be an actor, and I was kicking around the theater trying to catch on. I saw this ad in the paper said, you too can be a radio announcer. And I thought, well, you know, let's go find out what it's all about. So I went over there, and uh, it was a con by a couple of would-be agents. And they sent me around to the usual radio school who wanted $50 for a course in radio technique. Uh, who had $50? And... Uh, so I said, well, look, if you think I'm as great as, you know, you say I am, I'll give you 10% of my action, you know, manage me. <laughs> if I'm that great, we'll all get rich. So they thought I was a little bit too big for my britches and too smart for myself, so they made me a teacher. I'd never seen a mic in my life until uh, that day, and uh, I became an instructor. <laughs> it was kind of peculiar. Well, I guess it was. When did you... Uh... There weren't any students on my head. I quit. <laughs> when did you begin knocking on the doors of the networks? Almost immediately. Uh, radio then, you know, was a little bit different. There were about uh, maybe a dozen or 20 people who produced shows, dramatic shows, in New York at the time. Mostly independent producers and uh, a few advertising agencies. And I made up a map. And I laid it all out very systematically. And I'd start at the at the 57th Street end. That was the furthest uptown. And I would work my way down, in and out and around every block, till I had covered all 15 or 20 or whatever they were. And it took me about a week to 10 days to cover all these places. And then I would start in all over again. And I kept this up and kept this up and kept this up. And this is the way you have to do it. Lord knows how many uh, pairs of shoes I wore out, until finally somebody gave me a job. You're one of that breed that doubled as uh, actor and radio announcer. Which were you applying for when you were making those rounds? I applied. Um, originally, I started out as an actor, some impersonations, which I no longer do, of people you never heard of anyway because they're all dead <laughs> and gone 30 years but I've always figured out announcing was just another facet of acting anyway. You act the part of a salesman, and that's what announcing really is. What were the uh, networks looking for in those days? Now, we're talking about the oh, early uh, 30s. They wanted the rich, oratund, precise, pear-shaped tone. Not terribly British, but if you sounded a little bit on that side, that was, that was impressive as the devil. <laughs> They were looking for, really, you know, a voice of authority. After all, uh, there has to be a certain amount of authority. They were looking for an excessive amount. And don't forget, we had a lot of static to cut through. You know, radios were not what they are today. So they were looking for that rich, uh, precise, pedagogic uh, sort of tone, and they got it. They certainly got it when they, uh, when they hired Jackson Beck. No, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll vouch for that. Well, Ed, as far as your collection of uh, Jackson Beck memorabilia is concerned, uh, where would you like to begin? Well, I thought uh, many of our audience may be wondering, you know, the voice is familiar, but where have I heard it before? You know, it's not on radio, it, where, it was not on television. Where could it be? And it ends up as in cartoons because Jackson Beck <laughs> was the, the big monster in Popeye for many, many years. Bluto, and, uh, or Bluto, Bluto, and uh, on which series you like. I never knew until I met him that he actually, I always thought it was him, but I wasn't sure he was the one that played that part. So if anybody's wondering, you know, where they heard their voice before, that's probably where it was on that. There's many yeah. hundreds of cartoons that you appeared in. Well, of course, we can't play cartoons on radio too effectively, Jack, just, so... Uh, oh, uh, I <laughs> would be too sure. <laughs> I'm going to ask Ed if, uh, if we could hear something from Superman, because that's the, the one show that I recall as uh, listening to it as a kid in which Jackson Beck's voice cut right through the mustard. Well, it sure did, and uh, not only did he, was he announced, but he played the, uh, the part of the office boy. It was that Beanie, wasn't it? Yeah, that that's show? right. Now, there were two office boys. One was Jimmy Olsen, the other was Beanie. Jimmy Olsen was played by Jackie Kelk or Jack Grimes from time to time. Uh, he was the senior office boy, and he's the one that appears in all the cartoons. But there was a sort of subsidiary character for comedy relief, which I did, which was kind of a rip-off of uh, Ezra Stone's Henry Aldrich. You know, a real cracked voice, high kind of, Gee whiz, Mr. Kent, what are you going to do next? <laughs> you know. And uh, everybody get panicked and fall down. I just wish you had a recording of all the breakups that took place. Because that show was Hysteria Incorporated. And many's the time that we broke up and rolled on the floor. And it was 
You know, it was tough then because everything was live, nothing on tape. So if, if you made a boo-boo or you fell on the floor and you got hysterical, with no, you know, cutting the tape and then going back and doing it over again when you sobered up, you know, it was amazing. The show went on and came off on time because at least once or twice a week we all got the laughs. The Adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, the man of steel. And today, Robin, youthful assistant of the famous Batman, tells him why he so desperately needs his help. But before we join them for the exciting story, let's hear from Dan McCullough. Okay, Dan. Say, gang, the other day an army pilot I know was over at my house looking at some pet model planes I had. And you know, he made a very interesting remark. He said that these pet planes were some of the best models he'd ever seen for identification work. And uh, he thought that all of you ought to be able to learn a lot from them. And I'll bet you have, too, if you've been making that super delicious cereal, Kellogg's Pep, your own special breakfast. Because right inside every single pet package, there's a colored cardboard plane model all ready for you to put together. And you don't have to send in a single penny for it, not even a box top. What's more, there are 14 different models you can get all together. Four British, two Russian, and eight American. And on the back of each model, there's a list of valuable pointers on how to spot that particular plane, as well as a general description of it. So, gang, if you haven't yet started your collection of these nifty plane models, get busy right away. And remember the name, Pep, P-E-P. And now the adventures of Superman. Sensing a story in a mysterious note addressed to Superman... Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen rented a boat and rowed out on North Bay, where they found an unconscious boy in a rowboat. On their way back to shore with the boy, they were run down by a large speedboat and were near drowning when Superman appeared and rescued them. At a doctor's house, the boy revived and identified himself as Dick Grayson. He said he had sent the note to Superman and was in great trouble, but refused to discuss the matter with anyone but the Man of Steel. Clark Kent took Dick to his apartment where he left for a moment and then reappeared as Superman. He told Dick he had seen the cape beneath his coat and the red leather vest with the letter R on it and recognized him as Robin, companion of the famous Batman. The boy admitted his identity and pleaded for help. You've got to help me, Superman. You've got to. Now, this sounds serious. It is. Batman has disappeared. What? Yes. Batman has disappeared. Great, Scott. Where? When? I don't know where. He left me in our cottage at Queens Point. That's across the bay. Yes? He told me to wait for him there. He said he'd be back before evening, but he didn't come back. He didn't, eh? When was this? I mean, when did he leave? It was yesterday. Batman left right after lunch. He said he'd be back in a few hours. Did he say where he was going? No. All he said was that he was working on the biggest case of his life. He said that the fate of the whole world depended on it. Fate of the whole world? Yes. You've got to find him, Superman, because what I'm afraid of is that those men got him. What men? The men who came to our cottage last night. To get me. Now, wait a minute. You better tell me about that. I was going to. When Batman hadn't returned by dinner time like he said he would, I began to get a little nervous. And when he wasn't home by 10 o'clock and then by 11, I was really worried. I decided to wait another hour and then call the police and start looking for him. But then Alfred, he's our butler, came into the living room where I was watching the clock. I say, Master Dick, we seem to be getting company. You mean Batman's back, Alfred? Unfortunately, no. But I was just out in the garden, and I observed half a dozen men sneaking up from the beach. They seem to be surrounding the house. What? Quite. And the bounders have guns. We seem to be in a bit of a predicament. What? I switched off the light, went to the window, and looked out. Alfred was right. There were men surrounding the house. They'd spread out, crouched down low, and they were sneaking up behind bushes and trees. The doorbell. Well, what do we do now? There are too many for me to take on alone. I'll help. I know a trick or two. No, too many guns, Alfred. Open up in there. We've got to get out of here and fast. Come on, Alfred. It's my word, but where? The gun chaps have the house surrounded. I'll show you. Come on. I took Alfred down to the basement into a trap door that opens when you press a hidden button behind the furnace. I got it open and pushed Alfred in, following him just as we heard the men force their way into the house. I closed the trap door behind me and let Alfred through the tunnel to the boathouse. There was another trap door there that you could push up from underneath. And I started to open it when I heard voices. We got it in the house. 
boys will get him and then we can blow. Yeah, we get a grand for this one's up then. <laughs> He's just though I ever made. Shut up, no names. Hey, what's that creaking noise? There are two men in the boathouse, Alfred. I see. What do we do now, Master Dick? Wait for them to give up looking for us and then go to the police. Alfred and I stayed in the tunnel all the rest of the night, Superman, and all the next day. The men didn't leave, eh? No. And... Just a minute. When you opened the trap door in the boathouse, one of the men there said they were being paid by... What was the name? It was an odd name. It sounded like Zoltan. Zoltan, eh? Okay, go on, Robin. Well, like I said, we stayed in the tunnel all that night and all the next day. I kept hoping Batman would show up, but he didn't. And then I knew something had happened to him, and I had to try to find him. Look, Alfred, I've got an idea. But you've got to help me, will you? Of course, Master Dick, you know that. Good. I've written a note. I want you to deliver it for me. Deliver a note? My word, I'll be happy to, but how do I get out of here? I'll take care of this fellow in the boathouse, and you... But the chap has a gun. Oh, I can handle him. Now listen, when I tackle him, you run out the back door of the boathouse. It's dark, and chances are you can slip through the grounds without being seen. And step on it to the Daily Planet newspaper as fast as you can. Right home, Master Dick. What? I, what? I, I don't you. Oh, King Alfred, run! I, I'm on my way, Master Dick. Come on, the black Oh, Well, for a while there, we had quite a tussle. But Batman taught me judo, you know, and I was able to knock the gunman out. Then I got into our rowboat and started pulling away. But when I was about 200 yards offshore, I heard the man I'd knocked out come to and start yelling. A little later, I heard a speedboat start up. It had a powerful spotlight. And then... Yes, I can guess the rest of it. They uh, caught up with you and shot you. That explains your head wound. Now, you listen to me. Clark Kent may be back here before... Uh, well, before I return. If he does show up, trust him and go with him. Do you understand? Well, yes, but... But what can Mr. Kent do? Almost as much as I can. So long, Robin. Where are you going? Out this window. Why, well, no, but what about Batman? You let me worry about Batman from here on in. See you soon. Up! Up! And away! Leaping into the darkness, Superman swiftly disappears. Only to return an hour later in his guise of Clark Kent with Dick's dry clothes. Then, taking a taxi, Kent and Dick rode across town to a dark street facing a deserted park where we join them now. See that one-story building we're coming to with the two wide barred windows across the front? Uh-huh. What sort of a place is it? Well, there are gilt letters on the brick just above the windows. You see them? Oh, yeah. Zoltan's Wax Museum. Zoltan! Keep your voice down. That's the name the man in the boathouse used. Uh-huh. Or I think it was. Yes, you see, that's just the trouble. You're not sure. But it's the only lead we've got so far. And this Zoltan, who owns the Wax Museum, is the only one with that name in the phone book and the city directory. Come on. Where? I want to have a look through those windows. The street lamp behind us throws a little light. All right, hold up now. Hmm. Just a lot of life-size wax figures standing around the floor. Yeah, they look kind of weird in the dark, don't they? Yeah. Oh, gosh, look. What, Dick? Over to the left, against the wall. What? It's Batman. Batman? Yeah, look. It's Batman. Yes, I see. Only... Only he's a wax statue. Startled, Clark Kent's eyes followed Dick Grayson's trembling finger to the silent, life-sized figure of the missing Batman. What can this mean? Fellows and girls, there's a startling surprise in store for you and for Superman on Monday. So don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station, for another exciting episode in The Adventures of... Superman! Faster than a speeding bullet! More powerful than a locomotive! Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound! Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Do you know how being a preferred borrower at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank can help you? The other day we asked a man who was waiting in the personal loan department if this was the first time that he had applied for a loan at the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. No, he said. It was actually the fourth. Why had he come back to the Burrett? Burrett was his bank. The loan officers were friendly and sympathetic to his needs, and they were willing to take the time to discuss his financial problems and help him. The rates are lower, he said. Monthly payments are convenient, and once he had established credit at the Burrett, 
He had become a preferred borrower, and his loans got top priority. Sounds like a position you'd like to be in? If so, drop in at any one of the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank's five convenient offices in New Britain, West Hartford, Rocky Hill, and Glastonbury. You, too, may become a preferred Burrett borrower. The long-term benefits are tremendous. Now, there's, a, there's a show, Jack, that uh, you're particularly fond of, Man Behind the Gun. Ah, Why was yes. this one so special for you? Well, I'll tell you, I think probably it was the best radio show ever put on from every aspect, from the physical production to the writing to the performing to the whole concept of the show, the direction. Everything that was concerned with that show was top drawer. And uh, it really made me, as a narrator, because I carried the whole thing. This was a show during the war, the World War, second one to place it exactly and it had to do with the day-to-day -day experiences of the different of men in the different branches of service we were one of the first shows really to use the vernacular to uh it was played it was a propaganda show naturally we were at war with japan and germany it was directed at the men in the uh, defense plants it was directed at the general public as a morale booster and it was directed to the men in the service to let them know that their work was appreciated we used 13 sound men to give you an idea on one show which had to do with uh, the name of the show was bathtub charlie had to do with a gunner on a b-17 we took him out of one dog fight into another on a bombing mission over germany and there were 13 sound men reproducing three or four separate dog fights when f uh, flights of different German planes would come up, Fock Wolfs, Messerschmitts, Heinkels, the whole bit. And we had the authentic sound. These were recordings which were made on wire originally and transferred, made on wire, you know, in Europe during battles, uh, then transferred to uh, vinyl or whatever we used for records in those days, and, uh, you know, then transformed into sound effects, and it went on from there. It was written by Ronald McDougall, who went on to uh, write a couple of... Uh, Oscar-winning movies, actors like uh, Larry Haynes, who lives up here in Connecticut, Frank Lovejoy, Myron McCormick, Bob Dryden, uh, Bill Quinn, Art Carney. Boy, I mean, it's like calling the role of uh, I guess it who is. was who in those days. We had a uh, full orchestra of 30-some-odd pieces with special music cues. We worked out of at least one studio which most of the main drama took place. But sometimes we spread out into the halls because it was a really big physical production. It was an hour show. And uh, it's probably the, about the best thing I ever was connected with. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents The Man Behind the Gun, dedicated to the fighting forces of the United States and the United Nations, and broadcast in the hope that these authentic accounts of men at war will bring you a better understanding and deeper appreciation of the job our fighting men are doing on every battlefront in the world, and the job we have to do to back their attack with an extra war bond. During the past year and a half, the man behind the gun has covered nearly every aspect of the global war which our boys are fighting. But some of these broadcasts seem to be more memorable than others, and we are constantly receiving requests from you to repeat them. One of these is Prep Joe, a story of the PT boats in the South Pacific, which we originally broadcast last May. Many of you since then have asked to hear it again. And so tonight, the man behind the gun is the skipper of a motor torpedo boat, a PT named Prep Joe. You're coming in, and it's raining cats and dogs. You're on the open bridge, and the rain runs off your cap and drips down the back of your neck. 
Along the river on each side, the jungle presses down in a tangled mass. And great mangrove roots coil and twist like bloated snakes all along the shore. Your quartermaster looks at you questioningly. Think this is it, sir? Yes, I'm quite sure. Our base should be around the bend. Tell everybody to stand by four and a half. We're coming in. Stand by four and a half. We're coming in. Standing by. You can see it now. Your base. Just the way they said it would be. You round a bend in the river, and then there's this clearing and a collection of the lousiest-looking tumble-down shacks anybody could ever hope to see. That's it. Motor torpedo boat base number X. Affectionately called the Times Square Yacht Basin. Blow four, Grab. Let's wake up the joint. Aye, aye, sir. Throttle down. Aye, sir. Stand by the line. Aye, aye, sir. Now up ahead in the clearing, you see the door of the biggest hut open and a crowd of guys peering out into the rain. They wave casually. Some men run down to the wharf and stand there, waiting to catch your mooring lines as you come in. Right, brother. Left a little. Easy, does it. All back full. Cut engines. All right, heave your lines. You feel pretty good. You came in nice and pretty with all those guys watching you. A nice start. You hope they saw how smooth your crew handles the boat. Plenty of zip and polish. Neat, but not gaudy. Rick Regan, you think? You're a seagoing son of a gun. And you jump ashore and slog through the mud up to the officers' quarters. Which one of you is Lieutenant Farron, the squadron leader? That's me. Ensign Charles Regan reporting for duty, sir. Glad to see you, Mr. Regan. Come on in. Meet Thanks. the boys. That's Lovejoy, Quinn, Tarplin, Haynes, Carney, Tip Letty, and Bacchus. Yeah, I know. Glad to know you guys. How about some Joe and a sandwich, Regan? Hey, you're talking my language. You practically live on sandwiches in the torpedo boat fleet. There isn't much time or space or facility for eating anything else. So you have a sandwich and some coffee. You look at your squadron mates carefully now. And now you begin to notice things. They're thin, all of them. Almost emaciated. Their uniforms, what's left of them, hang in folds. And their faces are lined and tired and nervous. That's it. They all look nervous. You look at Farron. His face is lined the same way. He sees you looking at him and he smiles a little and reads your thoughts. Yeah. It's a tough grind. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, well, you can relax now. You guys have all had your turn at being heroes. Now it's my turn. What was that historic remark, Lammer Pants? <laughs> I said it's about time you guys gave somebody else a chance of being a hero. Whoa. Does that mean that you don't want to be a hero? It means that I want to be alive. I've had the Battle of the Pacific so long I can taste it. Give me a crack at the Battle of Broadway. That's all I want to know. It's a good thing everybody doesn't feel that way. You give me a pain. A big pain. Terrible pain. In fact, you give me the biggest pain I can ever remember having. Lay off, Hackett. I won't lay off. I'm getting fed up with these college boy heroes who come out here yammering for glory and a chance to win the war single-handed. Guys who think the war is some kind of a summer extension course at one of the better universities. Why don't you lie down someplace? You'll find out, Glamour Boy. You'll learn what war is like. One of these days, Glamour Pants, you're going to wake up out here and realize the war is something more than a high-class football game for nice boys from good families. Take it easy, Tommy. Take it easy. Uh, I had to get it off my chest, George. I've been sweating it out all day. I'm going to hit the sack now. I'm sorry I popped off, Regan. I apologize. Shake? Okay, I don't blame you. Good night, everybody. Uh, don't pay too much attention to Hackett, Regan. He didn't mean anything personal. He, he was shouting at the world. What's the matter with him? Is he yellow? Yellow? No, Hackett isn't yellow. He's had the fever pretty bad, and he's sweating it out more than usual, but no, he isn't yellow. You see, Regan, his best friend got picked off by a Jap destroyer about a week ago. You're taking his place. So that's how it is the first night. 
Not a terrific start by any means. But you don't lose any sleep over it. You've met sore heads before. The next day, it stopped raining. That means you'll be going out on a sweep come sundown. The boat's in first-class condition, and you've got a wonderful crew. No reason why you can't go out and pick off a Jap destroyer tonight. You hope you do, because you're teamed up with Hackett, and you want to show him. Late that afternoon, you get your instructions from Lieutenant Farron. They're brief and to the point. Take it easy this first time out, Regan. Watch Hackett and the Long Tom and do what he does. If you spot anything, don't be too anxious about knocking it off until you see what the whole situation is. Good luck, mister. Thank you, sir. You go down to the dock where the prep Joe waits for you. Long and sleek looking. Hackett is already aboard the Long Tom. He waves at you briefly and impersonally. You wave back the same way and then get down to business. Wind him up. Stand by to get underway. Wind him up. Stand by to get underway. <laughs> Now your exhausts are spitting blue smoke, rippling the oily water. You look over at the long tom as it moves slowly away from the dock, churning up a white, creamy wake. You are next. Stand by your line! Let's go left! Let's go forward! All ahead slow. Hard right rudder. Hard right rudder it is, sir. Steer on the lead boat. Aye, aye, sir. Following the lead boat. Slowly you wind your way down the river behind the long tom to the open sea. It doesn't take long... And just as the night comes down like somebody pulling a shade, you reach deep water. The long tom up ahead digs her stern down and begins throwing up a bow watch. Hackett is opening up. Open her up, Grab. Aye, aye, Skipper. You're on your way now. You smell the heavy night air and it's like perfume. The offshore wind brings you an intoxicating scent of flowers. The huge blossoms that cover the tops of the trees like a blanket. So far, it's the best war you've ever been in. Hours go by. You're about a hundred miles from your base now, cruising up and down behind the long tom. You haven't seen anything, and you've got an idea Hackett is deliberately avoiding trouble because you're new on the patrol. You're debating with yourself whether or not you should call him on the TBS, the interboat radio, and ask him about it point blank when your radio man comes up and pulls your trouser leg to get your attention. What is it, Sparks? Long Tom on the pipe, Skipper wants to talk to you. Okay, give me the cans. You clamp the earphones over your cap and grab the mic. Hello, Long Tom from Prep Joe. Acknowledge. Hello, Prep Joe. This is Hackett on the Long Tom. Are you on, Regan? Yeah, Hackett. Go ahead. There's an enemy force of some kind about four or five miles ahead. Probably trans force to Guadalcanal. I'm going in to investigate. Will you follow me? Certainly. Shall I muffle up? Yeah, good idea. Let's go in now. Not too close until we see what's what. Okay. Okay. Right. Keep both feet on the deck, sailor. Oh. Roger. Okay, Sparks, I'm through. Better get to your gun. We're going in. Aye, aye, sir. Man your battle stations. All hands put on life jackets. Pass the word. Man your battle stations. All hands, life jackets. Helmsman. Aye, sir. Signal engine room to close mufflers. Aye, aye, sir. Now the PT's motors are muffled as it tracks the enemy. And you're trying to bore a hole through the darkness ahead for the first glimpse of him. It's tough. It's as black as the inside of a motorman's hat. You keep looking out through the night, watching for the telltale silver streak of a ship's wake, or the looming bulk of a vessel silhouetted against the starlighted sky. And then finally you see a dark blot against the white shoreline. There he is! Stand by the torpedoes! Hadn't we ought to wait for the long time, Skipper? Why wait? We could fall on our face from waiting. Stand by your guns. Aye, aye, sir. Signal engine room to open mufflers. Aye, aye, sir. Steering collision cog. Blizzard course to this, sir. Now the prep Joe opens up and leaps through the water like a scared minnow. The sudden acceleration nearly yanks your arms out of their sockets as you grab onto the handrail. Now you'll show them. You'll show them all. You look over at the long tom. Hackett is hanging back and you grin to yourself. No guts. How far, Grab? How far away is he now? About 2,000 yards? Or a little more, maybe, Skipper. Okay, keep her as she goes. We're right on. You're alone now, alone in the night. You've left the long tom behind, and you stare fiercely at the ugly black bulk ahead. It's your baby, all yours. Then suddenly the whole universe lights up in a blinding glare. Searchlight! Light! 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 Light!
Action, Sergeant! Long beams of light snake out from the enemy ship and catch the prep Joe in their glare. The boat starts twisting and turning desperately, trying to shake off those fingers of light. You're in trouble now. Something's gone wrong. Everybody is fumbling around, trying to hang on and not knowing what to do. Now you see flashes of light all along the counter of the enemy ship. They're shooting at you. Shoot out their lights! Get their lights! Come on, come on, open up! Come on, come on up! Then we'll go in closer! Get back on a collision course! Aye, aye, sir, but it's... Get back on a collision course, I said! You're really fouled up now. All you can think of is getting in close enough to do some damage before the Jap rackets you. The boat straightens out now and bears down on the enemy ship. This is the end of the line, you're thinking. This is where you get off. Only a miracle can save you now, and then it happens. Out of the blackness ahead, another torpedo boat streaks across between you and the enemy ship. It's the Long Tom pouring out a heavy trail of smoke. She's laying down a smoke screen ahead of you, and her gunners are raking the Jap's deck. One by one, the enemy's searchlights wink out. It's pitch black again, and you don't waste any time getting out of there. Hold for home. Let's get out of here. Close mufflers. Aye, aye, sir. Closing mufflers. You're breathing heavy, and your shirt sticks to your back. It was a pretty close thing there. The boat slackens speed now with the mufflers closed. You throttle down to a crawl, waiting for the long tom to clear through the smoke screen. Grab and two of the boys are swarming over the boat, looking for bullet holes. And there are plenty of them. It was a pretty close thing. And if it hadn't been for long tom and Hackett, you feel pretty low down. Our guest tonight on the Golden Age of Radio is Jackson Beck, who um, appeared in such marvelous roles as Beanie and the Superman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <in> historic roles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there were many others, and uh, you were the original Cisco Kid, Jack. Yes, I was, as far as radio was concerned. I was the original Cisco Kid. I did Philo Vance. I was the lead on the FBI in Peace and War. And I did such shows as the Kate Smith Show... Hobby Lobby, if anybody remembers that. Hey, you, you, we you, the people. I remember Hobby Lobby. I remember one time they had a talking dog. Were, were you on that show? By any <laughs> Probably <time>? was. But, <laughs> you know, you weren't the talking dog ago. by no, any time. No. Oh, and I did Ripley's Believe It or Not, which was a great show to yeah. be on. The one show I remember so vividly in that one was the night uh, we had... Uh, Louis Armstrong as the guest. I don't know what the connection was. We're doing a story on Louis Armstrong, you know, believe it or not. We had B.A. Rolfe's brass band, and Louis drowned them out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we did two shows then. We did a show for the East Coast, and then we did a repeat. And on the repeat show for the West Coast, they were waiting for him. <laughs> and he drowned them out again. <laughs> During this era, when you were so active in uh, radio, and I don't want to give the impression that you're not active in it today, because, uh, Jack, every time I uh, turn on TV or uh, well, the radio, your, that way. Your, voice, that way. <laughs> your voice that way. is doing uh, either a, a shaving cream commercial or uh, you were doing a series for uh, these toy cars Oh that yeah, really turned me on. I thought that was... Yeah, you even bought one, didn't you? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I mean, uh, this is shows you the power of, power of your ability. But during this this golden era that, that we like to uh, talk about, you were also the, uh, the voice, the narrator for the movie tone news type things that we saw. I just used a commercial term, which Path is probably... A, Path, 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 Path A News. News was yeah. the one you were doing. And the, the news also, of the week. That yeah, we I also did Paramount. Those were turned out, obviously, every week. Yeah, every Thursday night. We'd do it at the Pathé Studios, for instance. But at, at any rate, by the time I would get to the studio, and I wasn't the only uh, voice on this, Dwight Wiest was on it with me, all the film would have been edited. Now, they threw this film up on a screen, they gave you a script, and you did it to the film. By that I mean that uh, there were cue marks punched into the film... You would know this because you've done it too, but mm -hmm. maybe people listening in don't understand how it's done. There's a, a punch on the in the film, and when that punch shows up, it means there's a white spot, that's when you start talking. There's another punch, and you'd better be through by that time or you do it over again. <laughs> uh, you're going to do that and do that and do that until you get it right. Uh, by the time you're through, it's midnight, and you really were wrung out because it's hard work. Well, Jack, you are one of the few people that we can talk to who is probably more active today than you were then. 
How, how do you feel about the business today, aside from the fact that it, it, it is a lucrative business for uh, someone of your ability? But, but how do you feel about performing in it today? Is it more cut and dried? Is there more challenge today? Yeah, there is. First of all, in those days you had... Let's, let's take the announce part of it. In those days, the predominant commercial was the one-minute commercial. So, and you know, I've always thought of myself as a salesman. My job is to sell. My job as an announcer is to move that stuff out of the supermarket, off the shelf, and into the home. You had a minute commercial. In a minute, you could, in 60 seconds, you could develop a story, a feel, and uh, a sales message. Today, you're limited. The longest commercial, how long has it been since you've seen a minute commercial? Can you name the last one you saw? You don't see them anymore. Well, they're all 30, 30 seconds. seconds yeah. 30, 20, and 10. Mm-hmm. Now you have to do what you did in 60 seconds in 10, 20, or 30 seconds. So you have to do it. It's more of a challenge in, in many ways today to uh, do what you're supposed to do because the time in which you have to do it is that much less. As far as acting is concerned, well, the only opportunity... A fellow like myself has for acting is on a soap opera, a TV soap. Well, I love doing TV soaps. I can think of nothing better than a fresh script every day. Fortunately, I'm a quick study. I can learn a half-hour script in an hour, hour and a half tops. And uh, once I have it, I have it. And I like being on my feet. If I had to do the same thing day in, day out, like a Broadway show, I'd bore myself stiff. Mm. So I like TV soaps. I like it. It, I feel free doing it and easy. And uh, but that's the only opportunity you have, and you're physically limited because you look like your part in radio. There was no limit. I could play Beanie the Office Boy, or I could play a hero, or I could play a heavy, or anything in in between. An old man, a young man, a foreigner, with any kind of dialect that happened to be necessary, and nobody knew. Well, Jack, you mentioned playing the lead in the FBI and Peace and War, and uh, Ed has come up with a great excerpt from this series. This uh, particular show features Charita Bauer, and I think the uh, ladies in our audience will recognize her as the lead in uh, the television version of The Guiding Light. And as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, she was also in the original radio cast of the same program. The FBI in Peace and War. The FBI in Peace and War. Another great story based on Frederick L. Collins' copyrighted book, The FBI in Peace and War. Drama, thrills, action. Tonight's story, Dumb Luck. Oliver. Huh? I looked out the window, now what? Read your movie magazine. I read it. Well, go in the club car and have a drink. I've been. Amy, I am trying to read the newspaper. We should have flew, Oliver. What? In the airplane. This takes too long. What are you reading? Well, I'm reading about a Texas millionaire who dropped dead two days ago and left three and a half million dollars to a college with 175 students. How much is that a piece? Oh, Amy. What are you reading about dead people for? That's morbid. Amy, go buy another movie magazine. Why about dead people, Oliver? Because, my little idiot girl, I... Oh, I don't think you should call me that. Even joking. Well, because, my dear, I don't see any reason why that college should get all of the Texas millionaire's money. I'd like some of it myself. Who wouldn't? Hasn't he got relatives? Not a one. Poor guy. Yeah, it's very sad. So how would you get some of that money? Well, I don't know his background yet, but he was only 49, and it's always possible that he secretly promised to marry, or even married, some poor girl, and then died without ever mentioning that fact to the executors of his estate. He had a girl? Well, it's possible, isn't it? And when this poor, deceived little thing reads in the paper he's dead, naturally she's going to turn up with her lawyer and with letters in... In uh, Charlie's handwriting. Charlie who? Uh, The millionaire, Charlie Emmett. He deceived her, huh? Well, it's possible. So where is she now? Well, she may be right here in this compartment, for all I know. Where? You, dear. I never even heard of the guy till you mentioned him. As a matter of fact... Yes, dear. I get it. Oh, you do? Yeah, I'm her. That's right. And you're my lawyer. Right again. 
Well, how much could we get out of it, Oliver? Well, if it worked, enough to buy you a reversible mink coat. Who ever heard of a... <laughs> You're teasing. It'd be too hot a mink coat on both sides. Yeah, it probably would, yes. Let me see the paper. I told you what was in it. I know, but if my boyfriend dropped dead all of a sudden, at least I ought to read his notices. <laughs> Oliver Dean Santley, wanted by our Bureau for fraud and forgery, was one of the most intelligent swindlers in the business. During his various prison terms, he studied law, practiced penmanship, read avidly on every subject under the sun, and prepared himself for more swindles. His campaign to defraud the estate of Charles Emmett of Texas was researched down to the minutest detail. He spent days on county records, looked up old newspapers, visited every town the Texas man had lived in. With a full background and his girl, Amy, standing by, Santley called on the executors of the Emmett estate. And then he showed me these letters from Charlie to the girl. I just wouldn't believe it. I thought I knew all about Charlie. Are you sure, sir? Well, naturally, I asked him some very pertinent questions. Oh, he has the facts, Arthur. You know, in many ways, Charlie was a brilliant man. But when it came to women... Oh, uh, that's often the way, sir. Yes, I'm afraid it is. No man who has a million dollars ought to be allowed to write anything but business letters. Especially after age 40. Although there were very few leads on Santley, we did get some encouragement when one of his victims gave us a business calling card that Santley had left while posing as a lawyer. The address on the card was a non-existent number on the street in downtown Chicago. But we figured that something must have prompted Santley to name this street, so we began checking. With Santley's photograph, we canvassed every building on the street. In a nightclub, we finally came up with something. Let me see that picture again. Yeah, that's him, the big blowhard. What's he wanted for? A swindle. I knew it. If I told her once, I told her a hundred times, this guy is a phony. Lay off. Told who, Mr. Grogan? Her, Amy, that dumbbell. But oh, no, he's distinguished looking, she says. And I say... Who is Amy, Mr. Grogan? She used to sell cigarettes here. She was so dumb, I was keeping an eye on her. I see. No, you don't. This was strictly on the up and up. I'm not the Marion kind, but if I had a been... I gather this young lady... She did. He called for her one night a year ago, and she just never came back. Have you any idea where they went, Mr. Grogan? Sure I have. I could practically give you a map. Every couple of months she sends me postcards. Dear Eddie, wish you were here. Love, Amy. We'd like to see those cards, Mr. Grogan. I tear them up. Every time I get one, I'm so mad, I tear it right up. But the last one was from Dallas, Texas. How long ago was that? I don't remember. A couple of weeks, maybe more. You think she's still with Santley? All she says on her postcards is, Dear Eddie, wish you were here. Love, Amy. She puts a T on wish. But you're sure the last one was from Dallas? I'm positive. Mr. Grogan, do you happen to have a picture of the girl? Yeah, yeah, I got one. Eh, yeah, but look, she's a good kid. I don't want anything to happen to her, except she should learn a lesson. All right, now. Now, where did you meet him, Amy? I met Charles at the Club 16 in Los Angeles, where I was fulfilling a singing engagement, oh. and... What's wrong now? You're reciting it like you were reading it. Well, I did read it off that paper you gave me. I know you did, Amy, but the idea I'll is... try once more. No, 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 no. I can't take any more till after I eat. I'm sorry, Oliver, but once I learn about me and Charlie... No, what... no, that's it. That's the way to say it. You and Charlie. That actually sounded as if you were his girlfriend. It did? Certainly. Now, what you have to do, Amy, is believe this. Think of the exciting places Charlie took you, how much fun you had together, how sweet he was... How one night you drove out to Palm Springs, and he said... Gee, Amy, I sure would love to see you in a natural silver-blue mink coat. Amy, Charlie was a romantic guy, not a walking bank account. Well, couldn't he express his romantic feelings in a practical way? Uh, come on, come on, let's eat. Oh, I'll get it, Oliver. Honest, I will. When do I have to see the lawyer? In a couple of days. Could we have chop suey tonight, Oliver? If they have chop suey in Texas. They have everything in Texas. Yeah? Everything, especially money. And I'd like very much to get my hands on some of it. Be a payday saver at the Big B, Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Come into any office of Burrett on the first day, the last day, the 15th day, or any day of the month, and you'll meet a select group of savers, the payday savers. Businessmen, tradesmen, professional people, career girls, and even mothers who save from the grocery money. 
Why do these people all stop in at the Big B? To save on a regular and very profitable basis. A payday saver is a regular saver, a saver who knows that only through a systematic plan of savings will he be able to pay for that college education, new home, or retirement trip around the world. At the Burrett, the payday saver receives 5% on a regular account with interest from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, 6% on two year certificates of deposit, 5 and 3 quarter percent on one year certificates, and 5 and 1 quarter percent on 90 day notice accounts. Join your friends at the sign of the Big B, the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, with offices in New Britain, West Hartford, Rocky Hill, and Glastonbury. Become a payday saver. Deposits insured by FDIC. I'm curious to know, Jack, you're one of the best punch announcers I think I've ever heard. I don't do that anymore. You don't do that anymore? <laughs> <laughs> but have you, I was going to say, have you had to adapt to the, uh, is it the one-to-one style now? Yeah, This is the much. intimate style for uh, the benefit of our listeners who may not be familiar with the term. It's pretty much on a very personal level. Uh, there is still, in my particular approach to a commercial, a certain amount of uh, drive, not the kind of drive I used to use, not the real hard, overbearing, overkill punch, but there is a certain amount of drive to what I do because it's part of me and I can't get rid of it. On the other hand, there are certain commercials that copy demands a very, very soft approach, so you give it that very, very soft approach. Uh, you have to go with the times. You can't, if everybody, of course, I've always been an exponent of if everybody's whispering, you shout. If everybody's <laughs> shouting, you whisper, and that's the way you move it. Jackson Beck, thank you very much for being our guest tonight here on the Golden Age of Radio. Great fun sharing these recollections of your wonderful career. Well, it was great fun being here, and I hope the career goes on for a while. I'm sure I'm not ready will. to quit yet. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, this is Dick Bertel. This is Ed Parker. Good night. The Golden Age of Radio with Dick Bertell and the recordings of Ed Corcoran has been brought to you by WTIC and by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, serving Central Connecticut since 1889. Be sure to hear the next Golden Age of Radio broadcast Monday night, April 23rd, when our guest will be Mason Adams, the star of radio's Pepper Young's Family. With location engineering by Ben Zinkerman and the technical assistance of Bob Sherego, the Golden Age of Radio is produced and edited by Brian Hartnett. This is Al Tersey. Camel Cigarettes present Benny Goodman's Swing School, the Tuesday evening rally of everybody everywhere who gets a lift from the new pulsating music of youth, Swing. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Rita Hayworth and Charles Corbin in This Love of Ours. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. The makers of Instant Chase and Sanborn Coffee present the Charlie McCarthy Show.